So let's now go beyond phenomena that we are already familiar with and take our first crack at a quantum analysis on a new type of phenomena that we've not seen before. So this will be my second example of solving the time-dependent Schrodinger equation and this example is the example of a particle that hits or hitting, right, particle hitting a potential step. Now, by a potential step, what I mean precisely by this scenario is the following. So we could plot my potential v of x versus x, and it's not just going to be v equals 0 everywhere. I will still have that the potential is 0 when x is less than 0. So here is the point x equals 0. So my potential will be 0 down here. Let me color it in a little bit, right? So my potential looks like that here. But then, as soon as I cross the position x equals 0, the potential is going to take on a new constant value. So it'll look like this over here, kind of make it a little bit thick, right, like so. And that new constant value over here, I will call uh, v sub not. Now you'll notice when I do this, I'm really sort of dividing space into two different regions. So throughout this analysis, I will call this x less than 0, region 1, right? And over here, this other region where the potential has gone up a certain amount, I will call that region 2, and that will be for x uh, greater than 0. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to send in a particle from the left here with a certain amount of energy. So here is the energy associated with the particle that I'll be sending in, right? So this is energy E. And now the question really is to inquire as to what a particle would do that comes in with an energy at this level into this system. So we can think about this first classically to get ourselves oriented, then we can ponder a little bit what we would expect to find quantum mechanically. Oh, now, one last little comment before we, we go on here. You'll notice, a little technical comment, you'll notice I'm drawing a discontinuous function. But my claim is, and, and you've heard this before from me, right, is that in physics there are really no true discontinuities. So when I draw a potential like this, what I'm actually talking about in terms of, you know, mathematical rigor is that I'm really talking about a continuous function. So I should kind of color it in with a little bit of curvature here, right? And it comes up very steep, very steeply like so. And so my idea, though, when I draw it as a discontinuous function is what I'm really saying is that the, the distance over which this is smoothed over is smaller than any of the relevant length scales in the problem. So I'm going to leave you guys to ponder a little bit what that relevant length scale might be for this particular problem. And I, I want to leave that as a little bit of a, a, an unknown, a little mystery, a little challenge for you. Because coming up in a few lectures, we're going to see where we're going to run into an, a, a paradox, or really an apparent paradox. And the resolution to that paradox will be that we actually violated this condition, that we will be thinking about a step that is rounded over, but not more sharply than the relevant length scale. So we'll just let that, you know, kind of, kind of settle in. A little a teaser for you for future lectures. Okay, so aside from that little technical point, we wanted to think about what we can expect to happen classically in this case. So the way, you know, classically we would analyze this is we would make a trajectory, so we would solve for the position of my particle as a function of time t, right? Here will be my time axis, and what I'm doing is I'm sending my particle in with a given amount of energy, which also equals its kinetic energy over here because the potential is zero. So it'll have a certain velocity. And I'm going to send this in so that my particle comes in with a, a constant velocity. And I'm going to time things perfectly so that the classical particle will actually hit. Here I'm plotting x versus time t. It's coming in along this trajectory. The plot of x versus t right? The slope of that gives me my velocity, so I'm coming in here with some initial velocity, and I will time things perfectly so the point at, in time at which my particle hits this step will be at exactly time t equals zero. So I'm plotting for you here then the solid line will be the classical trajectory. We will think about the quantum case in just a moment. So the qu classical trajectory then will be this solid line. Now, 
What happens when we hit this uh, potential step? Well, if you think about it a little bit, you will notice that the potential here is greater than the energy. So the classical particle actually does not have enough energy to exist over in this region. If you want to think again classically, we can see it mathematically this way. Classically, the energy, of course, is always the kinetic, p squared over 2m plus the potential. And so the uh, kinetic energy is always equal to the total energy minus the potential. In this region number two, when the potential is greater than the energy, that would mean the kinetic energy has to be negative, right? We'd have some imaginary momentum. That can't happen in classical physics. There's not enough energy actually to get over this barrier. So what happens is the particle can't exist over here, so it has to actually rebound. So it will be perfectly reflected. The total energy is conserved, so it'll come back with the same kinetic energy with which it went in. So it'll come outwards then, reflecting off my step, and it will come out with exactly the same velocity. So the slope over here will be minus uh, the, the slope that I had coming in here on the right. Very good. Now, this introduces a little bit of terminology for us, right? Because the particle is classically not allowed on this side. So this is what's called the classically forbidden region. That's my region 2. And this region over here, then in contrast, is the classically allowed region. The particle is perfectly happy and is classically allowed to be um, in this region. Very good. Now, how about quantum mechanically? Well, quantum mechanically, of course, you know, we, we don't have a precise position on our particle. But nonetheless, I could prepare, as we know how to do, in fact, we just saw an example of it when we looked at the particle in free space, is I can prepare a little uh, wave packet, which has a certain center of mass location, and I can send my wave packet in where its energy, kine the kinetic energies and the momentum are all centered around this classical energy E, and I can send this packet in towards this step and observe its behavior. So what happens initially, if I just track the average position, so now this will be the quantum, the quantum trajectory. Now, of course, when we're talking about the quantum trajectory, we have to be talking about, say, the maximum position, or maybe we might think about the average position, one of these type of variables. As I, my particle approaches the boundary, I can line it up with the same speed and the same center as the classical particle. So really, it's going to track along perfectly the classical expectation. Now, when it hits this potential, something interesting happens. Right? I can't, in classical physics, have an imaginary momentum. But quantum mechanics, we're not so sure, right? The momentum, you know, we've got all kinds of complex numbers running around. And now this is a claim, right? I'm just foreshadowing what we're going to find. But what we're going to find is fascinating. What we're going to find is that, in fact, we can actually penetrate into this classically forbidden region. This is something, a phenomenon called quantum tunneling. And it still, though, doesn't have enough energy to be allowed in this region. Not, you know, classically not allowed. So we can't actually ever, it's very hard for us to actually observe the particle over here. So that region, although temporarily the particle can uh, be found there temporarily, it can't in the long term. So it is eventually rejected from the forbidden region and ejected back into the classically allowed region, at which point, because again energy is conserved, it's going to come out with exactly the same um, velocity with which it went in. So this will have a velocity minus v. My two lines here are supposed to look parallel. They're supposed to have the same slope. I see I didn't do a great job of that. And now um, this portion here is called quantum tunneling. And you guys have all the power now from knowing how to solve um, qu uh, the equations of quantum mechanics to actually uh, uh, 
predict this behavior for yourself. That's what we're going to be working on. Now, one of the signatures of this is that we will find, if we look at the point in time where we cross any particular value of x, the classical particle will cross first at an earlier time than the actual, that's what we would expect classically, would be first, whereas the actual center of the packet is going to come out sometime later. And so we can characterize this fact that we've quantum tunneled into here as a delay. So there's going to be some kind of delay time where the quantum packet comes out. It will be delayed relative to what we would have expected from the uh, classical case.